Finally, continuing our rush through the ages, we get to the beginning of the modern world. So in many ways, it is the Renaissance, the Reformation, and the Scientific Revolution which inaugurate the beginning of modernity. Uh, in historical terms, but also very importantly, in um, philosophical terms. So if this was a history course, we'd talk much more about this. Um, but I suppose vis-a-vis uh, -vis our last topic, talking about the unity of medieval uh, uh, Christendom, what happens, I suppose the most, the most momentous, the most important event is the Protestant Reformation, again, initiated by uh, 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 Martin Luther. There are important um, social, economical, even uh, uh, technological factors that lead to the success of the Reformation, printing press uh, um, among them. But the basic consequence of the Protestant Reformation is the Thirty Years' War. So um, the Thirty Years' War um, was much more than just a religious conflict. But religion definitely played an important role. Again, we're talking about uh, um, Catholics versus Protestants. It was a tremendously bloody conflict. And again, as, as I alluded to uh, um, in the previous sections, um, in certain portions of Europe, a quarter to a half of the population died um, due to fighting, but also due to um, disease and general upheaval caused by this uh, uh, terrible war. And so what happens is that the Christians are forced to agree to disagree, right? And this unity of Christendom is, uh, is destroyed. And as soon as um, the Western Latin Christendom is split into two, it then begins to fragment more and more and more. And again, I mentioned this. Today we have maybe 40,000 denominations of Christianity. So there are several aspects of this new modern worldview that I want to focus on. Um, skepticism, empiricism, materialism. Right? So skepticism comes back to the fore, partly because of the new discoveries of, of the new science of people like Galileo, Kepler, um, Copernicus, later Newton. Right? So this, this notion that uh, some of the ancient doctrines which were held to be completely indubitable are now called into question. Like for example, uh, the Earth is no longer considered to be the center of the universe, right? but only a planet orbiting um, around the sun. Um, a Reformation also has a very, very important consequence in terms of skepticism, because again, you see, many Christians hoped that in this fighting, in this horrible war between the Catholics and the Protestants, God would show a sign that one side would win or that some people would come and God, through some clear divine sign, would show who is right, perform a miracle, you know, <laughs> resurrect the dead or something like that. Or maybe Jesus would come in the second coming. And none of this happens. And this also leads to a certain surge uh, uh, um, of skepticism. And again, think about this for a moment. The new Protestant denominations assert that the Catholic Church has corrupted our understanding of the Bible. But you see, the Protestants themselves, the first of the first generation, were baptized by Catholics. So if Pope is really the Antichrist and uh, Catholic Church is evil, then it means that true Christianity in an important sense is lost and everything is sort of uh, uh, up in the air. Everything is up for grabs. Like, once we begin to doubt uh, uh, the Catholic interpretation of the Bible, then we begin to doubt what kind of books the Catholics include in the Bible. How do we translate them? How do we read them? So all of this raises skeptical uh, doubts which are hard to answer. Um, so empiricism, again, this reliance on the senses, reliance on experience, has much more to do with the uh, um, scientific revolution, but we ha have to keep it in mind. And then very importantly, again, also associated with the scientific revolution, but also with the rediscovery of the ancient texts of ancient Stoics who were materialists, and ancient Epicureans who were also materialists, right? Again, this notion, materialism in this sense, anti-teleology, that this world is not necessarily uh, governed by Aristotelian purposes, but maybe this world is something like the abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter that the uh, 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 ancient Epicureans thought it to be. So again, so materialism is anti-teleology. So in political terms, 
we are now talking about the sovereign states and self-conscious individuals. So as opposed to this unity of the Roman Empire and again, the, the universal pretensions of uh, the popes in the Middle Ages, the universal ambitions of the Holy Roman Empire, which was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire, it's a separate topic, right? Uh, in, um, as opposed to this uh, claims to universality, we have an emergence of individual sovereign states. The uh, sovereign comes from the uh, Latin word, which means supreme. So states which are supreme within a given territory. And in addition to this, we have the emergence of the self-conscious individuals, self-conscious individuals. Again, there's some uh, um, aspect of this that has potentially to do with uh, uh, the emergence of the printing press and the emergence of silent reading. Again, in general, Catholicism um, has this deeply communal aspect. We read the Bible together. We read the Bible aloud. And it is the priest who tells us what is the right reading of the Bible. And in fact, people are, can pray for one another People can pray for their loved ones after they died. And this was also incidentally why indulgences, uh -huh, paying money to the church in order to get your sins absolved, made sense in Catholicism. Protestantism, with its uh, skeptical elements, skeptic skeptical of the Catholic readings, uh, you know, the, 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 one of the first major criticisms was the criticism precisely of the uh, um, uh, institution of selling indulgences, right? Protestants now, people like Luther, again, this, uh, if, we had, if this was a class in theology, we'd talk much more about Luther. Uh, but for our purposes, the most important doctrine that Luther has is that an individual must read and understand the Bible for themselves. And, you know, if a priest misleads you, it is still your fault and you are still going to hell, right? Catholicism, in this sense, offered much more um, comfort to the, in, to the individuals because they were members of the community. And our responsibility to God, in many important respects, was communal. But in Protestantism, it is one-on-one, -on -one, an individual responsibility before God. You should decide how to read the Bible, which books, again, to include in the Bible. Uh, in what priority to read them and how to interpret them, right? And you will be responsible uh, uh, before God. So again, this emergence of sovereign states and self-conscious individuals. So the emergence of the sovereign states and of self-conscious individuals is going to be the new political reality that political thinkers down the line will have to deal with. Let us very briefly, uh, in order to exemplify this new worldview, talk about a uh, um, wonderful uh, Italian philosopher, Niccolo Machiavelli. Now, Machiavelli is actually writing before the Reformation, but I feel that the spirit of his philosophy, to a very large extent, exemplifies the spirit of the age. So, um, in Machiavelli, we have, you know, if we were to try to summarize Machiavelli as brief as, possibly, as possible, we have this deep commitment to this new anti teleological potentially, you know, um, in, in the anticipation of this materialistic worldview. This world is not necessarily a good and orderly cosmos. Um, in fact, there's a realization in Machiavelli that um, this world is full of uh, suffering. It is not the best of all possible worlds. And in fact, like harmony in an important sense is not natural. Social harmony is artificial. You have to work. You have to work very hard if you want to achieve good results, you cannot just count on the world being good. Um, in a similar fashion, you know, relatedly, there's this idea of anti-utopianism in Machiavelli, that we are not trying to imagine that people are good, that people are virtuous. We start with an assumption that human beings are self-interested, human beings are self-centered, that human beings are not naturally cooperative. Again, that order and harmony is not natural, but Order and harmony is artificial. Again, so individuals are not naturally cooperative. And therefore, that social harmony is artificial in a deep sense. Again, we talked about how for the ancients, there was this notion of virtue, how virtuous societies produce virtuous citizens who in their turn reinforce virtuous societies. Beginning with Machiavelli, we have this notion that human beings by nature 
Well, you could say human beings are by nature bad, but Machiavelli probably would not say this. He would say that the world is bad, and people do whatever they can to survive. So human beings by nature are not cooperative. And so you need institutions that are going to force uh, potentially antisocial individuals to behave in pro-social ways. And sort of within this uh, uh, new schema, kind of new scientific progressive schema that there can be a science of politics and we can again reform this program, we can, we can change the world for the better, there's also this very important uh, uh, idea of uh, um, political realism, again this broadly speaking, this acknowledgement that human nature, uh, both individual and social, political, is, is not cooperative. There, there is no natural harmony between individuals, but also there is no natural harmony between the states. That as Hobbes later is going to say, covenants without the swords are but words. Or uh, as Machiavelli says, again, that uh, um, the important political emotions are love and fear, and fear being more important than love. And that the, the ruler, like, um, Politics is a dirty business. The politician has to get his or her hands dirty. And in order to achieve the end of social harmony, we have to often employ the means which are less than, uh, less than palatable. Unseemly means, right? And again, Machiavelli is uh, um, associated, his name is associated with this doctrine that the end justifies the means. And again, many students I talk to have this intuition that somehow this is a deeply, supremely amoral doctrine. That if you say that the end justifies the means, this is uh, um, somehow an abhorrent conclusion which should be avoided at all costs. But let me ask you, you know, let's keep an open mind, let's ask ourselves, now why does Machiavelli say this? I don't think Machiavelli actually tries to uh, somehow justify evil for the sake of evil. No, again, he says that sometimes uh, um, politicians are forced to employ drastic means in order to achieve social stability, social harmony, peace, security, those kinds of ends. And so Machiavelli would, I think, ask us, if it's not the end that's going to justify the means, what could justify the means? If it's not the end, what is it? Intentions? Yes. The saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Would you rather have politicians who have good intentions and, uh, uh, you know, lead their society to ruin? Or would you have shrewd, unscrupulous politicians who employ unseemly means, but do, in the end, effectively achieve the means of peace and stability? These are going to be the questions that we're going to have to grapple with. Uh, uh, in our next segments as we proceed to our discussion of modern political philosophy.